Um, we've been doing this a long time. I think collectively 76 years, 2,200 programs here, Denver, Boston, now Washington. The City Club, this event today is our 1,075th. And this particular event, the City Club La Jolla Country Day State of the Nation Address, began about uh, 10 years ago. <laughs> and this extraordinary couple, two of my favorite people in the world, it's a real privilege, seriously, to know them, to be considered uh, their friend. They're just so, so terrific. And I want first for you to acknowledge the presence of the woman who for 12 years was the first lady of the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Kitty Dukakis. A few years back, I took a group with me to Fenway Park. Where's Jay Jeffcoat? Jay Jeffcoat's been a part of that. And uh, the governor invited some of us to have uh, a late breakfast at their home in, in Brookline, 85 Perry Street, because he was serving his famous pecan waffles. And Jeff Marston, who was a former Republican state assemblyman, was at the breakfast. And because the governor walks everywhere, and whenever he sees trash, students, pay attention. Whenever he sees trash on the sidewalk, he stops and picks it up and puts it in a receptacle. Every American should do that. He does it. So we walked to Fenway Park, and as we're walking to Fenway Park, I said to Jeff Marston, you know, when the governor led the Commonwealth for 12 years, he didn't have a car and a driver. He rode the tea to work every day, and he rode it home every night. And I said, how many security people do you think Mitt Romney had when he was governor? Jeff said, oh, I don't know. I said, try 19. And he said, oh, that's not true. I said, hey, ask the governor how many security people he had zero on the tee, and the governor next coming on, Mr. Romney, 19. Anyway, in my view, teaching now at Northeastern, teaching at UCLA in their 19th year, um, I don't know of a greater public servant. I don't care what your politics are. You can be right-wing conservative. If you're a fair person, a fair person, you will acknowledge what an extraordinary person he is and how lucky we are in this republic to have him still committed to public service. Welcome, please, the former Mass governor of Massachusetts, Mike Dukakis. As I always say after I get one of these glowing Next time I run for the presidency, George Mitrovich will be my champion, <laughs> and we'll do better. Um, anyway, it's great to be here, and it's great to be back out in the West, as George just told you. This is our 19th consecutive winter quarter at UCLA, and as I say to our friends back in Boston, it's a terrible burden. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it, and uh, it's really been great. Uh, not only that, but Kate, despite her New England origins, and I know we've got a whole bunch of former New Englanders around here. Kitty, for some reason, seems to tolerate New England winners less and less. I kind of like them, I like this too, but she doesn't. And this year, she was complaining about the cold in October <laughs> in the middle of what was a beautiful fall, New England fall. And those of you in New England just know just how beautiful it can be in the fall. But I finally said, look, we gotta stop. We're not gonna get out there until late December. She's going to start complaining about this cold stuff. Anyway, so she's very happy being out there. By the way, this uh, bride of mine just celebrated her 77th birthday. Yeah. We're all getting older, and she seems to be getting younger, so uh, there we are. But uh, we really are blessed to have each other and uh, have eight wonderful kids. I'm sorry, three wonderful kids and eight grandkids. <laughs> Fortunately, we had a tough summer. Um, 
we decided that we would celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary by taking our kids, their spouses, and our eight grandkids to Greece. A few days in Athens, doing the sights, Delphi, Necropolis, then off to Crete for what we hoped and expected would be a wonderful week together. Unfortunately, on the plane from Boston to Athens, I got this deadly organism, which I'd never heard of, but when I mention it to folks who know more than I do about uh, medicine, they kind of recoil, something called pseudomonas, which I guess just flies around. And the ventilating system, uh, it got into my left eye, and pseudomonas can destroy a cornea in about three days. I came with about six hours of losing my left eye from this thing. But I must say to you folks, that if it hadn't been for a terrific team of Greek doctors and nurses, I'd have lost it. These folks knew what they were doing. I was hospitalized for the first time in my life, six days. We never made it to creep, but uh, we saved the eye. But if you're wondering why I'm wearing spectacles these days, it's because I have some loss of vision, and some of that may be cataract related. We'll find out about that. But at least I've got my eye, the infection's gone, and so on. But it was really kind of scary. But here's the thing. And somebody came up to me and said, now you are going to talk about healthcare. Well, <laughs> uh, it so happened that the second day that we were there, we'd done the Acropolis the first day, the second day, and the new Acropolis Museum was <coughs> The second day we went to Delphi, and I had arranged for a guy in a van to take us out there and to do a <coughs> remarkable tour, and then we were going to have lunch at a restaurant. By that time, it was obvious that this eye was in trouble. It was hurting me, seemed something seemed to be developing the eye, and all this kind of stuff. And the owner of the restaurant at which we had lunch, who had been a former mayor of Delphi, took a look at it and said, I want to take you to the local community hospital. He, by the way, is the first cousin of a remarkable guy that some of you, I think, have met down here who sells olives. Oh, yeah. George, yeah. our friend. Oh, George. First cousin, it turns out. Um, and there's a whole story about that, about three Greek brothers who came over here in 1910 and planted an olive grove and then went back and George discovered it was there and kind of arranged to gather the olives and all that. So anyway, this guy's his first cousin. Took me to the local community hospital. But fortunately, on an early Saturday afternoon, there was an ophthalmologist. And uh, he sat me down, you know, put me in the head gear and all that kind of stuff. And it was after he examined me, he said, look, this is very serious. You have an ulcerated cornea. You must get there. I can't preach you here. You must get to Athens, and just as quickly as you possibly can. Um, and so I said, thanks. We'll, we'll do that. You know. And so what do I owe you? He said, you don't owe me anything. I said, well, I've got to pay you something. Or, do you want to see my insurance card? He said, no, it's free. It's part of the national health system. <laughs> Think about that, folks. Even poor Greece that's been battered and banged and 27 percent unemployment, you can get health care from highly trained folks, including, by the way, the team that saved the eye. That'll kind of get us started on a discussion. <laughs> Incidentally, George's comment about uh, Peter Shumlin's State of the State Address in Vermont is something that we've got to take seriously. Um, we have serious addiction problems in this country. Um, and we're doing very little about it. And it isn't just about law enforcement folks. We have to begin with drug education, drug and alcohol education and prevention. I made that mistake when I first started our own effort when I was governor. Because you know, alcohol is just the drug in liquid form. And by the way, far more commonly used and responsible for far more, far more deaths, uh, health problems and so on, than so-called, you know, the other drugs. Uh, but it's got to begin in the early elementary grades. We've got to make comprehensive health education a, an essential, permanent part of our school curriculum. Um, and it's got to begin early. Middle school is too late in some cases. And uh, I see it on college campuses these days. For those of you familiar with college campuses, probably, I mean, Thursday, Friday nights, you know, half the, half the student body's drunk. <coughs> We're creating a whole new generation of alcoholics. Right? And uh, people using alcohol probably use others. 
Now we're talking about the recreational use of marijuana. Look, I'm not sure you, gotta, you want to criminalize marijuana. I'm not sure. I like the notion that uh, all of us are going to be invited to engage in the recreational use of marijuana. Something about that that caused I hope about the you. Because these are serious, serious problems. But it starts early, folks. And I can tell you, as one governor who managed pretty successfully to do this with very important and significant impact on what our kids would do in Massachusetts. It will work, but you got to do it. Unfortunately, I was succeeded by a guy named Bill Weld, who frankly had his own problems in this regard. And uh, frankly, and this is a, a whack of poor old myth, but the guy that, that actually finally killed the program was Mitt Romney. And I was asked several years later to chair, George, a national task force on the states and drug and alcohol abuse. Uh, it was a terrific group of people. Uh, we spent two years at hearings all over the country, produced what I thought was a pretty impressive set of recommendations. Folks, we couldn't get the National Governors Association to take the report seriously. And before Shumlin, George, I know of no governor in America who even mentioned this problem in his or her state of the state message. Of course, it's been It's a very serious problem, folks. And it's not going to get better as we welcome the recreation <coughs> use of marijuana. And it's an important part of what ought to be uh, this country's public health system and what we do to try to make sure this does not <coughs> Anyway, let me, uh, the best, parts, best part of these meetings we have is the Q&A anyway, so I'm going to try to keep my remarks at you really brief. But I want to spend a few minutes talking about the Affordable Care Act. Not the first time in this forum. I want, I, was, I want to share some thoughts with you about uh, national security policy and where we are in terms of our leadership in the world. And then let's hope we can open things up and, and have a good, lively discussion. Um, but you know, it's great to be out here. Um, there's something about being part of an effort to train the next generation of public leaders in this country, which is enormously inspiring to do that, I think, folks. Um, and I really mean that. I hope I'm inspiring these young people that I'm teaching, but they inspire me because we're producing some terrific young people in this country. And they want to do public service. They want to provide public leadership. And that's true whether I'm teaching at Northeastern <coughs> and East Coast, which, by the way, is one of a handful of so-called co-op universities where our kids go five years, not four. First year is all academic. Starting in the second year, they rotate. Six months work, six months study, six months work, six months study. These are paid jobs related to their major. Last year, Northeastern had 50,000 applications for 3,000 spots in the freshman class. The highest of any non-public university in America. And the kids I'm teaching at Northeastern are really serious about public leadership. So are the young people that I'm teaching at UCLA. And it's just a very inspiring thing to experience and feel to be a part of it. It really is. You know, we are we're just producing some great kids. And I hope and expect they're going to be great public leaders. Um, so let me start with the health care thing, about which there has been more stuff and nonsense than I've ever heard, I think, in any public debate. Now, many of you have heard we talked about this in the past, and I'm not going to go into a long discussion about the Affordable Care Act and so forth. But I am going to ask you a few questions, because this is a pretty thoughtful, informed audience. How many people do we have in the United States with no health insurance of any kind? Answer. 50 million. How many people do we have in the United States with lousy health insurance? <coughs> I think I mentioned before, we used to call these buffalo policies. They come here, but only if you're hit by a buffalo on Main Street at Newtown. Right? <laughs> Another 50 million. <coughs> what percentage of those people are working Americans or members of their family? What do you think? 85 to 90%. And I think one of the problems with this debate, frankly, is that those of us who strongly support the notion that working Americans and their families should have decent, affordable health care have not been saying that 
I talked to a prominent member of the Senate not too long ago. A friend of mine, a guy that I've known for years. And I said to him, it was Marky. I said to Ed, I said, look, I said, how are things going? He said, I'm worried about some of my colleagues, I'm afraid of colleagues, I'm real trouble. And I said, we went into this little thing. I said, you know, would you please tell them that the message here has got to be all about whether or not working Americans and their families are going to have decent, affordable health care. I said, 85 to 90 percent of them are working, you know, are members of their families. Marky said to me, geez, I didn't know that. And if you go out and take a poll tomorrow, folks, <clears throat> and ask the American people, should working Americans and their families have decent affordable health care, what do you think the numbers look like? 93% say yes. So for those of us who support the notion that working and their families should have decent affordable health care, why aren't we saying this? Yes, it's great that we're getting rid of pre-existing conditions, and it's great that you keep your kids on the policy until they're 26, but that's not the central message here. And there hasn't been a central message. The central message, in my judgment, has got to be, this is all about working Americans and their families. If you're working in the United States, and support yourself and your family, you and your family ought to have decent affordable health care. <coughs> Any debate about that? And frankly, the proponents of the bill, including the guy in the White House and congressional Democrats, have not been saying that. Now, I say all of this with great humility, because with a lot of respect for the president, he's got far greater communication gifts than I have. Look, he won twice, I couldn't even win once, so, you know, I thought it was right. <laughs> but um, but this, this is a message that we just aren't delivering here. An awful lot of Americans think this is another welfare program. We're taking money for them to give to those people, those people aren't working and so on. That is not what's going on, folks. In fact, if you run public assistance, as you know, you get Medicaid. Now, there's some other problems involved as well. The Supreme Court decision on the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act, in my opinion, was one of the worst Supreme Court decisions ever handed down by the highest court in the land. Why do I say that? Well, there are people in here who, I mean, I haven't practiced law since 1973. But even though, for those of us who favored the law, Thanks to the Chief Justice who came up with this interesting theory about how it was really a tax, even though it wasn't called a tax, which kind of saved its constitutionality by a vote of five to four with him in the majority. There were two aspects of that decision, folks, which are extremely troubling and terrible law. One of them was that uh, the so-called Commerce Clause, which, by the way, since the New Deal has been used as the basis for justifying social and economic legislation passed by the Congress, did not cover a bill seeking to, what, regulate 20% of the American economy, which is what health care is. <laughs> I mean, this is going back to the Hughes Court prior to the controversy under FDR court packing plan and all that kind of stuff. I mean, the notion, and this is a court, by the way, with my classmate Scalia writing the opinion, which a few months earlier, a few years earlier, had said that, uh, that the Congress could regulate people growing marijuana in their backyard because it had an indirect effect on interstate commerce. I understand privately that Scalia has said that he wished he had that opinion back. But I mean, that was, at the time, <clears throat> an example of how far the court was prepared to go, even with a very conservative judge, when it came to the interpretation of the Commerce Clause. All of a sudden, we have a Commerce Clause interpretation, which, believe me, takes us back to the huge court. That's not all. The second and even more damaging aspect of that, of that decision was the holding that Congress could not condition the continued receipt of Medicaid funds from the federal government to the states on the states adopting the Affordable Care Act and expanding Medicaid. That one is, from a legal standpoint, my judgment, absolutely off the wall. 
we must have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of federal grant aid programs in which the federal government provides funds to the states with conditions. If you don't meet the conditions, you don't get the money. It's as simple as that. But in this case, by the way, not only were the five conservatives, but two of the so-called liberals joining us in the court held that it was unconstitutionally coercive for the Congress to condition continued receipt of Medicaid money by the states on their expanding Medicaid to include, again, low and moderate income working people. Including, by the way, single people and people, not kids. I mean, an absolutely, absolutely preposterous decision. And um, the result of this is that millions of working Americans of low and moderate income in those states that have <coughs> chosen not to implement the plan will not get health care. Now, maybe politically, this opposition is beginning to break down. I noticed yesterday a report that the government, governor of the state of Utah, who's no lefty, needless to say, <laughs> has announced that he is going to support Utah's participation in the Medicaid program. That may be an important thing, but from a, from a, from a legal standpoint, from a judicial standpoint, from a constitutional standpoint, um, the notion that Congress can't impose conditions on its grants to the states and if the states don't choose to meet the conditions, they don't get the money. It's preposterous. I mean, in fact, it's preposterous. They're doing this for, for, for decades. And it's had the effect of denying billions of low and moderate income working people the opportunity to get decent affordable health care. Um, now, I can't tell you the rollout was lousy and so on and so forth. On the other hand, uh, as many of you know, uh, information systems these days are are screwing up all over the place. Uh, I don't know, has Boeing figured out its battery problem with the Dreamliner yet? That was a software issue or something. So whether it's private or public, I mean, we're having a lot of these kinds of problems. And by the way, the folks that are doing the work for these governments are all private sector people. I mean, they're private companies that, that are contracted to do this. Um, but it's obviously distressing to have that kind of a rollout, given the kinds of controversy that takes place, that takes place, that's taking place under this. Um, my prediction for whatever it's worth, however, is that now that the bugs are getting out of the system, and I think we just hit, what, three million new enrollees, yeah. mm -hmm. that um, I would guess by May or June we may have double that number. In which case, it'll be interesting to see how people feel about it and if governors in states like Utah start coming on the board. Because there are huge incentives, as you can imagine, and a lot of reasons why you'd want to accept that Medicaid money and enroll these folks for financial and economic reasons as well as basic health reasons. Um, it may be a very different picture. Uh, nevertheless, um, this is an interesting election year, needless to say, uh, my party had better get, get on this thing because otherwise there are going to be some serious consequences. And again, I do think the lack of a powerful message, which I think was there and is there, has uh, had a profound effect on uh, only the, the, the public opinion about uh, the administration, but also about Democrats in Congress and about uh, what is a plan that was developed, as many of you know, by conservative think tanks and sponsored <laughs> the December before Bill Clinton took over by 16 prominent Republican senators, <coughs> including Bob Dole, all of whom proposed this plan. In as a matter of fact, I remember John Chafee coming to the Harvard School of Public Health. I walked up Huntington Avenue to sit and listen to Chafee, and uh, Chafee laid out what essentially is Obamacare. And as you know, <coughs> in Massachusetts, thanks in part to Mitt Romney, though he certainly did his best to run away from the thing when he started running the presidency. <laughs> but to his credit, Romney put together a collaborative process of all the Democrats, uh, folks in healthcare, business, lots of people, and we now have the Affordable Care Act, Massachusetts, about 99% of our people have comprehensive health care, and it's working quite well. We still haven't solved the cost problem, although we're working on it. And that's the other piece of this thing. And that's the other thing I want to say about our current health care system. It's not only that it doesn't provide a 
affordable care for all or most Americans. This healthcare system of ours, folks, is from an administrative standpoint, the most expensive healthcare system of the world. The world. If you want to know why we're spending twice per capita on healthcare as the other advanced industrialized nations, a lot of it has to do with the expense of this system. 25 cents of every premium dollar is going for overhead. Compare that with three cents for Medicare. And dramatically fewer administrative costs in these other health care systems. systems. Why? Because it's unbelievably complicated. Here's one for you. My friends from Boston, who I think probably respond to this quickly. One of our best medical schools, we have four of them in Massachusetts, is the Tufts Medical School. Uh, its teaching hospital is the Tufts New England Medical Center, which happens to be in the south end of Boston, right in the heart of the city. Um, how many people do you think, by the way, medium-sized teaching <coughs> hospital, 400 beds. Not the Mass General, it's not the Brigham, this is a 400 bed hospital. How many people do you think they have on staff? Salary employees doing nothing but collecting. What do you think? 50, 75, 500 salaried employees in that medium-sized teaching hospital sitting in their cubicles all day long doing nothing but arguing with insurance companies. Why? Because you got 75 products and 50 billing codes and, and I mean it's just unbelievable folks. So one of the things that I and a few other people are working on right now in Massachusetts, I hope nationally, is dramatic simplification of the system. You know, three basic policies, one billing code, a clearinghouse to be created by the insurance companies to which docs and hospitals can send their bills once a month to get paid. Any doctors in the room? How many folks do you have on staff doing that? Three. Two, three, two. These guys, all in point two or three people just fighting with insurance companies. Their job is to go out there and practice their profession and you know, heal us. And there's a company called the ICD-10 that's coming. They're Co increasing to 60,000 codes. Codes, yeah, 60,000 codes. This will be one, it'll be one code. But think about it, think about it. 25 cents of every premium dollar going for what? Not for health care. Not to heal the sick. It's just administrative only. And maybe getting worse. So dramatic simplification of the system, so these folks can practice their profession and get this stuff off their back. And you know, of course, people say to me, "So what do you do with those 500 folks in Tufts and Leyland? You're going to lose their job?" <laughs> well, we train them as healthcare workers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Something. But isn't that unbelievable? <clears throat> okay, that's topic number one. Let me just switch gears here. And again, uh, if you think I'm hallucinating, tell me. <laughs> uh, this may sound strange to you folks. Kitty and I, look, I've been around for 80 years, she's just celebrated herself, it's ever forever. This is the most peaceful world we've ever lived in. You know that? <coughs> Serious. Despite all the sound of fury. Remember, we were kids of the Depression. We lived through World War II, and we remember. That was Vietnam. Sorry, that was Korea. That was Vietnam. Well, recently it's been other armed conflicts. But the fact of the matter is that uh, slowly, inexorably, and we're seeing it play out now. It's not pretty. In connection with Iran, in connection with Syria. Slowly but surely, we're building international institutions which increasingly seem to have the capacity to deal with these problems <coughs> wherever possible and increasingly without our conflict. Iran's going to be a big test. And you know, you all know where that started, don't you? When the United States decided to overthrow the Democratic government of Iran in 1953. I don't know how many of you were alive at that time. We were. We remember. And it was all because Winston Churchill wanted to hang on to the Iranian oil industry, which at that time was owned and controlled by the Brits. And I think the single most important thing the United States of America can do now and 
to our young friends, who I hope will be the future diplomats, in the future, <coughs> to do everything we can to build the strength and credibility of these international institutions so that they have the capacity to keep the peace and to make it unnecessary for the United States to feel compelled to intervene in just about every dispute anywhere in the world. Because folks, it ain't working. It ain't working. I mean, how many armed interventions by the United States have been successful? Stopping the North Koreans from coming south, stopping Iraq from invading Kuwait. You count them fingers on one hand. Most of them failed. And I must tell you that, uh, as I said before it all began, I can't think of a worse candidate for intervention than Syria, given the consequences of this kind of thing. Now, what we can do, what we can do is to seek to build the credibility and effectiveness of international peacekeeping institutions, starting with the United Nations, which has its flaws, needless to say, and the various constituent agencies of the United Nations, including, among other things, the International Atomic Energy Agency, and so on. And I think that ought to be the central thrust of American foreign policy and security policy. Um, I don't understand what we're doing in the Pacific, do you? Um, <clears throat> this pivot to Asia, what is that? Uh, our relationship with China is one of the most important relationships currently in the world. Um, China is going to be a very powerful country for reasons that should be obvious to any of us. So why aren't we working closely with China and with the other nations of Asia to try to build a framework for peace and collaboration? Here you've got six countries over there fighting about a bunch of worthless islands, right? Anybody think they have any value? Chinese, the Japanese, Japanese, the South Koreans, Filipinos, the Chinese. We've got an institution called the International Court of Justice, the World Court. It was created to deal with these kinds of issues. Why aren't we urging these countries to stop yelling at each other and threatening each other and to go to the World Court and get a decision? Now, they may or may not agree, folks, but if the United States were doing that, as opposed to what? I don't know, I'm kind of siding with you. Just, we just signed an agreement with Japan for a drone base in Japan. Does that make you feel good? <laughs> What's that going to do? What's that all about? Um, what I'm worried about is we get another Cold War shape it up here. This time it's going to be China. Got to have an enemy, somebody, someplace, right? I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I don't think I'm being naive in saying this. I really think that we are very close to that point in world history for the first time in world history where war increasingly is being ruled out as a means for settling disputes between and among countries. And I want to see our country, my country, leading that effort, as opposed to jumping in and out of every conflict on the face of the earth. Because, to repeat, we don't do it very well. In any way, we can't afford it. And to watch us spend hundreds of billions of dollars on uh, a defense establishment and strategy which in my judgment has less and less relevance to the world as it currently is and will be is very distressing especially when we have important domestic needs here at home that need resources and i don't care george whether you're talking about drug education prevention or a high-speed rail system in the state of california which you desperately need 55 minutes from la to san diego what do you think? right Two hours and 40 minutes from LA to San Francisco. What do you think? And where is it going? To a $12 billion supercarrier, which isn't working very well. And which seems to me to have very little relevance to the threat we face. There's a threat out there. It's terrorism. It's got to be dealt with. But I don't think supercarriers or F-35s are going to deal with Al Qaeda. Do you? Like I don't think they care about F-35s. Supercarriers. 
And I really think this is a particular point in history where the United States of America play a hugely important and constructive role in creating this world where you guys can build careers and lives that do very good things without wondering whether or not you're going to be caught up in another world conflagration militarily. And I don't think I'm being not even saying this, but we think we're that close. We're that close. And it's up to us, among others, to uh, keep moving forward in this thing, to repeat by doing what? By building credible, effective, international peacekeeping organizations that can finally achieve this goal, a world in which something other than military force is used to settle disputes between them. We'll continue to have civil wars, we'll continue to have that kind of thing. But even there, it seems to me, international peacekeeping institutions, mediation institutions, kind of thing imperfectly that is now being attempted in Geneva around the Syria thing. Unfortunately, it should have happened at the beginning, not now. Um, but that's where I think the United States can play a particular <coughs> role. We can do so without spending huge amounts of money on uh, the national security effort, which, again, to repeat, seems to me to have little or no relationship to the world that is evolving, that we're dealing with, and that we must be fully engaged. Don't get me wrong. I'm not an isolationist. I am a committed internationalist. You can't be the son of Greek, you know, Greek immigrants and be an isolationist. It's <laughs> impossible, right? But, um, but I want this country to help build that kind of international peacekeeping system, and I think we can do something. Okay, I'm going to stop at this point. I hope you've got lots of questions, comments, reactions. Feel free to challenge me. Uh, and let's have a good lively discussion, as we always do. Caroline Williams, first, then Bobby. Caroline. Okay, I have a question about question is, will Hillary run? How about the other possible candidates? Um, I don't know any more than you do, so this is all speculation. Yes, I think she will run. I think she will have a lot of support in the Democratic primary, and I think she is likely to win the nomination, uh, but she's going to have a battle in the final. And uh, I'm not saying she can't win it. I think she can, but this is not going to be a cakewalk under any circumstances. And if, in fact, the Democrats lose the Congress, including the Senate, it's not going to be a very uncomfortable two years for the President of the United States, but who knows what that's going to do. But um, I think she's healthy. I don't think whatever, she, whatever happened to her, uh, from a health standpoint, is going to be a disability. And, and certainly at this point, one gets the sense that she has overwhelming support among Democrats. But that doesn't mean that this is going to be a good, tough con uh, contest. Now, at the same time, without sounding too, too cocky, because one never is. You know, I'm a guy that was 40 points ahead of polls in my first primary re-election with five weeks to go and lost, so I heard the use of these numbers. Um, but the Christie thing is really interesting, folks. Let me pause briefly and talk a little bit about this. I don't know Christie, and I'm always concerned about people. Uh, look, I'm a huge proponent of public education, excellent public education. I'm very proud of the fact that my state is the best educational system in the country. And by the way, in international rankings, Massachusetts is right up there with anybody internationally. Very proud of that. We should be. We should be, given who we are. Um, but I can tell you from my own experience, if you want to improve your school system, the first thing you don't do is beat up on your teachers. This is crazy. The folks that are teaching our kids must be actively involved in improving the schools. And how do you do that? You bring them in and you make them a part of the solution, not the problem. So right out of the box, this guy bought it. Uh, the second thing is that, um, and it's hard to describe this unless you've gone through it, you can be a fine governor, you can be a fine United States senator, you can be a fine mayor. 
Folks, as soon as you say, I'm seriously thinking of running for, or I'm running for the presidency, your life changes dramatically. Everything you've ever done, everything your spouse has ever done, everything your kids have ever done, everything your staff has ever done, suddenly becomes very, very important. So what might have been viewed as being a kind of interesting political caper and what is an interesting New Jersey political environment, <laughs> what the hell, you know, tie the bridge up to a few days, give the guy a good New Jersey belt, right? <laughs> Suddenly, as national news, and as an old and dear friend of mine and colleague, no longer with us, one of the finest public <laughs> I've ever known, in fact, I use his book, my teaching, I used to say, in public, in public life, bad news follows you around like a puppy. <laughs> Once you get the bad news, it keeps following you around. And so what's happened here is that Christy, rather dramatically, has learned this lesson all of a sudden, which is, that, and you know, can you tell you, I mean, just stuff in our own lives that became very, you know, kind of big, press, and all this kind of stuff. I mean, and you've got to be able to live with that. You've got to be able to live with that. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen to Christy, but it seems to me if what's been happening over the past few weeks isn't fatal, it's hurt her pretty badly. And uh, at least as I look at the scene, Christy seemed to me to be the one Republican who could conceivably be a formidable candidate for the presidency as opposed to these other folks. I mean, I don't think the nation wants Ted Cruz. <laughs> even if he did go to Harvard Law School, which, you know, again, simply proves what? That a Harvard degree or any other degree is worth a plug nickel. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, there we are. But I think, to go back to your question, yeah, I think she's right. And um, I think she'll be a good candidate, but um, nobody's a sure winner in this business, ever. And given Citizens United and the kind of money that's being spent, <clears throat> on attack ads right now, on candidates for the Senate. Um, think of what's, what's going to happen with, if, if and when she's a candidate. So uh, it's going to be a very tough, spirited contest. But I think she will be a candidate. Claudia. Governor, I think you're a genius. I know you're smart. Genius. Genius. If I were a genius, I got myself elected. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were too smart. Yeah. <laughs> um, but here's the thing I'm sure a lot of Democrats are frustrated with. The Republicans stick stupidly, I think, sometimes. In fact, with the Tea Party, they certainly they stick together, they have a message, they stay on message. The Democrats don't. Now, I know, as who was it who said that um, I'm a Democrat, so any, anyway, everyone votes differently. I'm a member of an organized political party, I'm a Democrat. Who said exactly. that? Will Rogers. We, we swim in his speech, right there. Yeah, but, but why is it that, what, or what could they do to try to get into focus at least about some of the issues you're talking about, like health care. Why the heck, as you said, why don't people know that 83% of the people who don't have, who, um, don't have health insurance are, are working on the working family? Right. So, Aren't we doing that better? What could we well, do? what first, do? let's not romanticize the other side. <laughs> they are having terrible battles. In fact, John Boehner, to his credit, finally, I think, in utter frustration, said, that's it, we're passing a budget, the hell with these Tea Party people, and so on and so on. That was pretty extraordinary, folks. <clears throat> and the divisions within the Republican Party these days are huge, especially at the grassroots organizational level, where the Tea Party tends to control what's going on. But so don't attribute too much to those guys. And I think... Boehner's response and Ryan's response and so forth was, look, we can't take another shutdown. It's going to kill us politically. So um, they got plenty of problems. Our thing is less division, it seems to me, than, than understanding that communicating effectively is an essential part of getting things done as well as winning in this business. A lesson that, I'm sorry to say, I didn't learn as well as I should have in 1988. <clears throat> and that's why I think on this health care thing, you just missed it. Now, I'm no genius, believe me, particularly when it comes to this kind of stuff, but it just seems to me so obvious that um, if, in fact, the vast majority of uninsured people in this country are working, members of working families, 
And if you're running against one of these folks in a senatorial race, for example, the first question I ask them is, don't you think that working Americans and their families should have decent affordable health care? Tell us that you don't agree with that, because that's what this is all about, you know. Well, well, but we're not saying that. Well, I've made a few calls to the I've made a few calls to the White House. <laughs> I'm talking to I'm now I swear I'm going to get on the phone and talk to every one of these challenge Senate candidates and just say, look, uh, you know, consider the source. Yeah, <laughs> I would genius, right? Um, but I really think this is the theme you've got to adopt when it comes to defending your vote <clears throat> and taking it to the other guy when it comes to the affordable health care. Just seems to me it's just sitting there. Dr. Braun. I'd like to take you off the subject of uh, partisan politics for a little bit, because I would get to be pretty heat and uh, not too much time. There's a huge problem that you have uh, enveloped your own life in, in bringing America's youth up to, up to speed, in generating their capacity to influence the future. And there is a huge problem that's going along with that that's just as big as our problem with drugs, just as big as our problem with another thing and that is the expense of secondary education in America and the influence that it makes on the current upper middle class, if you will, that want to send their kids to college. We are preventing many children from getting to where we want them to go without huge debt. And that's a huge issue that a person like yourself ought to be interested in and have some opinions about. Why should college graduates be placed on the owner's point of entering into their economic and social lives with two and three hundred thousand dollars in debt. How many families can really afford that? And what should America do about that long term? It's all about where we put our money, folks. It really is, you know. And we've got to decide whether or not a college education and graduate school, if that's important and required, is going to be something that we're going to make available like most other advanced industrialized nations at relatively low cost. Now, how do you do that? Well, you've got to use public resources to do it. I am not a fan of cutting the cost of education with online courses. Do I sound like a modern-day Luddite? <laughs> Maybe I am. Now, I've taught for 22, 23 years at a school that I really love in Boston and now 19 at a school I also love out here. Um, I'd like to think that I and my colleagues provide something of great value, not only because we're in the classroom with our students, but because we are available to them anytime, as I try very hard to be. And I don't think I'm flattering myself when I tell you that there are an awful lot of young people that I've taught that are now providing great public leadership because they had an opportunity not only to, to sit in my classroom, but to give me a chance to mentor them, to, to guide them, to open up doors for them, and so on and so forth. And the idea that we're going to get higher education on the cheap with uh, online courses, which, by the way, no one really knows who is taking, without those very important aspects of a college education that don't involve, strictly speaking, listening, testing, all this kind of stuff, but have to do with relationships, with the growing up, um, with being inspired because you have a particular teacher that is inspiring, who kind of turns you on. I mean, those are all very important. They're also expensive. And uh, we're doing something on that score. I mean, we have Pell Grants, which for low-income people can make a difference. We have something called the Hope Scholarship, which many of my students don't even know about, which Bill Clinton thought was one of his great achievements, which is a, a tax credit for families up to a pretty generous level, where they effectively, community college is free for the first two years. And a lot of people don't know this. But we've got to do more. We've talked about you know, the cost of health care. What do you think the average doc or dentist comes out of medical school or dental school with a form of debt? Which is one of the reasons why so many of them decide they've got to be specialists as opposed to primary docs, because how are they going to pay that $300,000 back? Um, 
And here again, it's a choice of resources, folks. I don't want to go back to the question of what are we spending on defense, but we're spending billions, which in my opinion have little or nothing to do with the real security problems that we face, and those are dollars that could be spent to make it possible to. Reminds us of how many bases we have abroad. How many American bases do we have abroad? Any of you know? Want to guess? 837. In how many countries? 150 countries. How about 437? How about 337? Maybe 75 countries. I mean, what is this, folks? We've got a drone base now in Mali. Does that make you feel good? <laughs> Mali. We have a relatively new African military command under a major general. We're getting into Africa militarily. What is this? We've got an organization of African states. We have the United Nations. Wouldn't one think that those two organizations might be able to deal with some of these problems in the African continent? What? I, I, I really don't understand this. I think, uh, and, and now, of course, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but most of our American troops are coming home, right? They're going to be in garrisons, right? Doing what? Well, training, is all. But if you don't have any more wars, <laughs> the question is, what do we do about this stuff? And uh, again, I don't want to be facetious about this. I understand that this is not an absolutely peaceful world, but we, I think we've got to be thinking through just where we put our resources <clears throat> and whether or not, in the interest of our future and our national security, putting more of those dollars into <coughs> higher education for our kids is a lot more important. So why is. do you think we have 80,000 troops, and not just troops, but families and support in Germany, which has the best economy <coughs> in Europe? Because many, many years ago, we created something called NATO, right? Whose purpose, folks, was to do what? To stop the Soviet Union, as we used to call it, doesn't exist any longer, from invading Western Europe. A perfectly reasonable decision at the time. Is there any likelihood that Russia, as we now know it, is going to be invading Western Europe? I don't think so. So why do we continue to have NATO? Why do we continue to have 80,000 American personnel in Europe? Again, don't get me wrong. I want us deeply and actively involved in this world as a very constructive force, but is there any reason left for NATO? And if so, what is it? It certainly has nothing to do with its original purpose, because that problem has disappeared. Anyway, 837 American bases, 150 countries. Doesn't that make you feel better? <laughs> I don't think so. Um. Yes, in the back, sir. I was curious what you think about the uh, rise of the New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio and... You I'm sorry, Ben, speak oh, sorry. <coughs> sorry. Right. A uh, former graduate student of mine from Northeastern. Yeah, I usually speak a bit better than this in the back of the class, so I'm yeah. out of practice. Uh, Bill de Blasio in uh, New York City, he seemed to come out of left field, and it, there seemed to be a lot of surprise in this country about he could run on a certain platform and actually win New York yeah. City. Did he come out of left field, although some people in Massachusetts would say coming out of Cambridge was coming out of left field, right? <laughs> As a matter of fact, it's very interesting, folks. New York City now has its second consecutive governor. Who's from Massachusetts? New York. What did I say? Sure. Second consecutive mayor. Who's from Massachusetts? Bloomberg is from Medford, Massachusetts. By the way, a Jewish kid from Medford whose parents had to use a Christian lawyer as a straw to buy a house in Medford, Massachusetts, because Jews couldn't buy houses in Medford, Massachusetts. We've come a long way, folks. Anyway, went to Johns Hopkins, went to New York, made a billion dollars. <laughs> a couple of billion, three billion, four billion dollars. Um, and by the way, now to his credit, Larry's creating a nonprofit urban consulting organization that he is going to provide free of charge to cities that are looking for folks that can help them with their problem. Pretty good, eh? And now de Blasio, who grew up in Cambridge. 
Um, but I'm not surprised, Ben, at de Blasio's victory. Well, I am in some ways, maybe. Um, if you look at New York City, if you look at the vast majority of people that live in New York City, why would, be, why would we be surprised that a candidate for mayor who was universal preschool, who thinks it's important to build housing for families of low and moderate income, um, who believes in universal health care and these kinds of things, why wouldn't that candidate be a popular guy? Now, he does have some interesting interesting life stories, married to an African-American woman, who, by the way, was from Springfield, Massachusetts, was the first African-American family to break the color bar next door in Longmeadow, an immediate suburb of Springfield, racist graffiti on the house, all that kind of stuff in 1967. His wife went to Wellesley. And this is very proud of these folks. Um, and he's obviously got something. But I'm not surprised that He's, uh, he's, 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 he turned out to be a popular candidate, and um, biracial kids, I mean, look at New York these days. Um, now, it'll be interesting to see whether or not, uh, we just elected a uh, new mayor of Boston, you know, after 20 years of a terrific mayor of Boston. Who was Marty Walsh? Son of Irish immigrants from Irish Dorchester, who, um, Went to BC, had a terrible alcohol problem, had to drop out of BC. Finally, went into AA, went to work as a laborer, moved up in the union, became the head of construction trades, then ran for the legislature. And this is a guy from white Irish Catholic Dorchester who says that his proudest vote was his vote for gay marriage. and must have had a thousand recovering alcoholics knocking on door for him, and doors of for him in that campaign. And one, because of a superior field operation, at least to some extent, fueled by all of these folks in recovery. I'm not kidding. But is the world changing? And by the way, man, he shares a political philosophy, not unlike the Blasio. And I think Marty's going to be here. He and Kitty have worked on some of these issues together, and she'll tell you he's a terrific guy. So. The world's changing. We're going to do one more. It's going to be from La Jolla. We'll, we'll do one here, and then La Jolla High gets a question. But here's an important distinction between Bloomberg and de Blasio. Uh, Bloomberg went to New York. He was a Red Sox fan. He bought Yankee season tickets and Mets season tickets. He bought four Yankees, two Mets. De Blasio remains a Red Sox fan. Does this prove real character? <laughs> When asked about this, de Blasio said, look, I'm not going to kid anybody. The Red Sox were the team of my youth, and they will continue to be my team, notwithstanding the fact that I'm proud to be the new mayor of New York City. That's, that's guts, folks. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hey, hi. Tell us your name. Tell us your name. Well, uh, my name is Andre. And uh, first of all, Governor, I'd like to thank you for your service to our country, your long, great piece of service. And uh, I just wanted to ask you, well, what effect do you think these uh, smeared campaigns, like uh, personal attack ads, have had on your campaign in 1988, such as the one staged by Lee Atwater? And do you think they have gotten worse or have remained the same? Paul, Politics is a contact sport. <laughs> it has been since the beginning of the Republic. If you want to see attacks on people, go back to the period right after we became a constitutional republic. Um, I think Jefferson said the happiest day of his life was when he left the White House because he would not have to put up with the jackals of the press any longer. <laughs> and in those days, you didn't even have press that purported even to be responsible, to be highly partisan and so on. So we've had these for a long time. Now what's the difference these days? Well, a lot of it's electronic. There weren't pictures in those days. And electronic attacks, picture attacks, all this kind of stuff can have a great impact. But look, uh, when I ran for the presidency, I made a terrible mistake. I mean, the decision not to respond to the Bush attack campaign just turned out to be a terrible mistake. You just can't do that. Um, 
And you can't just sit there as I did, taking it. Because after a while, without a response, folks will say, well, at least some folks will say, I guess it's, there's something to it. So if you're going to be running for public office, not so much at the local level where I think things, one hopes, a little more genteel, but if you're going to get up there and run for major national office um, these days, especially with the Citizens United thing, I don't know if you've seen any of these ads that, uh, that the Koch brothers and so forth are running against, uh, in this case, incumbent Democrats, but you know, Democrats do it for Republicans as well. Um, they're really very rough, and, and they're, they're, there's a lot of money going into these things, which means that one has to be ready for this, and one has to develop a carefully thought out strategy for dealing with it in advance, preferably one that turns the attack campaign into a character issue on the guy that's doing it. I'll repeat that. Preferably one that turns the attack campaign into a character issue on the guy that's doing it. Now, I did that quite successfully in some of my gubernatorial campaigns. Don't ask me why I was sitting there doing nothing during the presidential campaign until it was obviously doing enormous damage to my candidacy. But that, there's no excuse for this. If you're going to run for serious political office, you've got to be ready for it, and you've got to have, as I say, a carefully thought out strategy. Um, one which effectively blunts, blunts those attacks without pulling you down to the gutter with the other guy. And, and you can do that, but you've got to think it through and you've got to be ready for it. And uh, in my case, and in the case of some of these other folks, by the way, I'm, I'm worried about some of these folks that are just sitting there getting pounded by the stuff and there's no response. That's a mistake. That's what I did, that's what Kerry did. You know, here's a genuine war hero running against a guy who was reading magazines at some airbase in Arizona and Alabama. <laughs> And, and he gets killed with this thing. Crazy. So, um, so you cannot, and I don't want it to discourage you guys from getting deeply and actively involved in public life. Because there's nothing like, I mean, maybe I should conclude with this. Let me say this to you. There is nothing like being actively involved in the politics and public lives of your community. <coughs> Believe me. Um, to be in a position where you can make a real difference in the lives of your fellow citizens is a very rare privilege for and good people working together can make a difference. I've seen it in my own lifetime. Are you kidding me? The country that Kitty and I grew up in was racist. It was anti-Semitic. It had five times the infant mortality we have today. You know, back then when the schools were wonderful, everybody behaved, nobody got pregnant. Remember those days? <laughs> <laughs> Kitty and I got out of Brookline High School in the 1950s. I didn't know her at the time. She was a freshman. I was a senior. She claimed she handed me a cup of water on Beacon Street in Brooklyn when I was running the marathon <laughs> <laughs> at the age of 17 in 1951. It's entirely possible because I was dying of thirst, but I don't remember her handing it to me. <laughs> but in the 50s, over half the kids in this country never finished high school, folks. Over 70% of the minority kids never finished high school, and most of them were going to crappy, racially segregated schools. That was public education. Now that's not an excuse for not working hard to improve the quality of our public schools or, and our schools generally. It's very important, we've talked about it. But uh, we have come miles. Why? Because good people weren't willing to sit there and kind of take this. They got into it. And I want you guys to get into it. So there's nothing like it to be in a position where you really can make a difference and trust me, you can make a difference. Thanks very much. Governor, you've been uh, part of the school now for a while. I'm Chris Lavin, Director of Marketing and Communications. And every Friday for some years now, I've left school here and walked to a public market in my hometown and every day I've seen uh, a man named George Petro on that He's Friday. Right. And over time he taught me to say Yasu <laughs> and a Marakalo. And, to, uh, the more, and he taught me about Socrates and Hippocrates and all the big, big things. And over time we've developed the, my, I show up like I've never seen him before. Whoever happens to be there, I start shilling his 
his wares. <laughs> this is the first cousin of the restaurant owner. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> well, he was, every week, every Sunday, I would tell him, or every Friday, I would tell him, we're going to be, he, you're coming, and he says, I'm going to be there this year, I'm going to be there this year. He's 90 years old. And uh, unfortunately, last night, his, uh, his wife had some health problems, and she, he's in the hospital today. But he did uh, send along the things that he wanted oh. to do. Oh. <laughs> and we've gone upscale here. He's, his packaging has improved over the years. <laughs> he wanted one for you and for Katie. Katie. Wow. If you folks have not had this, you must get it. <coughs> you must get it. And I just remind everybody, these were the first recipients of the uh, inaugural uh, Friends of Country Day Awards for the teaching they've done over the years. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I did want to ask what the governor thinks of the president of France. But there's a part of me which says, wow, the governor slips out of the, the president rather, slips out of the Elysee Palace gets on his motorbike, helmet, and rides several blocks to meet the newest interest in his life. Um, you can't make this stuff up. In any event, this has been great because Michael and Kitty Dukakis are great. Thank you all. <laughs> really great. Thank you.